And also we can see you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So you just get rid of that window, probably. Yeah. Sure. This There's window. One. Yeah. So you just minimize that. Perfect. Okay. And there's screen sharing. Okay. Do you want to go through this? Uh, it's like time to fly. <laughs> yeah. Looks great. <laughs> Yeah, let me know if you need okay. help. Okay. I used to do that, so you can see the slide there. Is that okay for me? Anything that works? Yeah, it's a little better on the visuals, yeah. and it doesn't really. Yeah. yeah. You can see them, but they can't see me. <laughs> 
It's a little bit cold, so our recipe says no, this is good. I'm surprised we have this many person. There's tons of classes going on right now. There's skipping classes. I, I suggested that they might reschedule. Uh, usually, that's I mean, we've lost a lot of time. Yeah, I saw that last week. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so everybody's um, trying to catch up. We're going to have that extra days at the end. Of, we already have to have a week because of that. That's that week right. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're going to have to add an extra after that. Oh, yeah. Are we already recording there? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So Silla is recording downstairs. Silla is recording yeah, downstairs. I yeah, and I'm recording, recording as well. Okay, great. This is streaming on the YouTube, our YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. only the top. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And the BBC News, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the American News. <laughs> It's a friendly universe. I would hope so. Usually geologists are friendly. <laughs> There's a few bad apples. But Don't assume they're all good. geologists. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. There's a fair amount of geophysicists. Well, we'll start up in a minute here. Um, we were just talking about the mass procedure and I'm not exactly sure what it is anymore. I saw the CDC announcement and then the president's announcement. So I, I think it's kind of personal choice, but it's encouraged when you're in tight groups, something like that. So, uh, keep mine off at least while I'm saying something. So as you know, we, we have a series of uh, faculty candidate interviews occurring this month. And um, each candidate, uh, Caitlin Gray is visiting us uh, today and tomorrow. Each candidate will give a presentation that's uh, a 45 minute presentation so we can keep on schedule. Uh, and in that 45 minutes, you'll discuss something about your research excellence and maybe a little bit about your teaching philosophy and so forth. And then we'll have about 15 minutes Q&A. All of these are being recorded thanks to the seminar team. And hopefully those links will be available uh, later today uh, so that if uh, anybody listening in who's not here uh, wants to watch the talk, and in addition to the one-on-one uh, -on -one and group interviews, uh, provide your feedback at the end of this week. So uh, with that, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Caitlin Gray. Uh, Caitlin is, is uh, one of our isotope geochemists, roughly speaking, uh, <laughs> candidates and doing a lot of interesting work in soils and water and tracing uh, phosphorus and other things, which I'm sure she's going to talk about today. And uh, you've all seen on every um, seminar announcement, there's a link to, uh, to Caitlin's homepage and anybody else's, but you can see their CV and everything there. Caitlin earned her Bachelor of Science at Rice University very good school in ecology and evolutionary biology and earth science, double major. And then she did a PhD at Yale in geochemistry. And uh, with that, let's welcome Caitlin. Thank you all for inviting me here. Um, it's nice to be back. Uh, I am from Austin, so nice to be back in Texas. Uh, so today, I will be going over phosphorus cycling in the past, present, and future. So let me get my laser pointer here. This image on the left is a eutrophic lake. Uh, these are very common nowadays, uh, ever since the agricultural revolution. So essentially, you have a surplus influx of nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, 
uh, which cause these algal blooms, which then lead to seasonal anoxia. What's interesting to note is that these events are not unheard of in the geologic record. Uh, on the right here is from Furlow Gorge in Italy. This is uh, OAE2, so Ocean Anoxic Event 2. So essentially what happens in this eutrophic lake happens on a global scale. So you see these deposits of finely laminated black shale uh, with high um, organic carbon content and high phosphorus content. Here is an insert inset of a um, ammonite fossil assemblage. So essentially uh, during these anoxic events, you also get really nice fossil preservation. So I'm gonna in introduce phosphorus. Uh, next I'm going to um, discuss how climate ex change affects nutrient cycling in the present. Going into how does it affect nutrient cycling in the past? I wrap up with how can we use phosphorus sustainably in the future? So something to note is that eutrophication is uh, global, it's worldwide. So eutrophication uh, leads to uh, anoxia. So each of these data points here uh, is indicative of seasonal anoxia. It's usually in the spring and summer months. So essentially you have these algal blooms, which you utilize all the oxygen in the water column, leading to um, essentially um, localized death because there's not enough oxygen for organisms to live. So since the 1960s, the number of dead zones has doubled approximately every 10 years. There's about 550 currently that are um, anoxic, um, and that number is increasing over time. So as we saw on that first slide, um, anoxia and these, uh, this uh, eutrophication is nothing new. The Earth has experienced it several times in its history. So there's several events. So uh, early to our sand, ocean ox event. Uh, there's also the Selly event. And then the one I'm really interested in is the Cinnamony and Turinian um, anoxic event that, that's OAE2. So essentially what happens is you have an influx of carbon dioxide um, or some other sorts of carbon, um, which we see in a carbon isob excursion. So it's indicative of there being uh, increased temperatures, and so essentially global warming, leading to increased continental weathering. And with weathering, we see that nutrient influx to coastal regions. And it's really the, that nutrient influx that causes these algal blooms, uh, which they unusable oxygen, and lead to anoxia. So I primarily work on uh, phosphorus. Uh, phosphorus is the ultimate limiting nutrient on geologic time scales. Something to note is that this is the red fill ratio um, for every one of six of carbon, you have 16 of nitrogen and one of phosphorus. Um, all of these three elements are linked together. Um, and so primarily I'm interested in what phosphorus is happening um, in both the past and the uh, present. So this is an image here of uh, phosphate concentration uh, in, the, in the oceans. Um, the oceans are actually um, usually nitrate limited. Um, it's actually, uh, continental regions that are more phosphate limited. So what is phosphorus? Why is it important? So it's an essential nutrient uh, for storing genetic information. So we look here, this is in our DNA, it's phosphate deoxyribose um, nucleic acid. So there's a phosphate backbone. Also ATD, ATP. Um, so essentially it is the powerhouse of the cell, we use it for energy storage. Uh, and also phospholipids, uh, which are used for cellular membranes, right? So there's two forms. There's these organophosphorus compounds, or P-organic. Um, there's also inorganic orthophosphatase, uh, orthophosphate, so that's PI. It is the most prevalent in the lithosphere and biosphere. So when it comes to microbes and to us, um, phosphate is readily usable. Uh, organophosphorus compounds, not as readily usable. So really, organisms utilize this compound here. So the phosphor cycle uh, is different from the nitrogen cycle in that the atmosphere is not involved. It's essentially um, rock that, uh, for example, uh, we mine. Uh, most ph phosphate rock is mined in Morocco. Uh, phosphate rock is a finite resource. There's only so much available. And um, essentially we'll get to a point where peak phosphorus has been reached and that um, we then have to figure out how to conserve phosphorus. So once it is mined, um, it will be converted to triple superphosphate, so essentially fertilizer. The issue with that is that fertilizer does uh, run off in the watersheds once it is applied for agricultural use. And it's that surplus phosphorus that leads these algal blooms. So surplus nitrogen, 
form of nitrate and ammonia and surplus phosphorus in the form of phosphate um, will directly lead to these algal blooms. Um, so anytime you see a lake that's very green, it's essentially eutrophic. Um, and that's ultimately what I'm interested in is these eutrophic events in both the past and the present. So it's another recap here. So how does eutrophication work? What exactly happens? So we have an influx of nutrients. So for example, fertilizer, that's either ammonium fertilizer or phosphate fertilizers. It runs off into the, the watershed. Uh, it promotes an excessive growth of phytoplankton. Uh, organisms need these nutrients to live. As I said, they need it for DNA, for, um, for ATP. And so when, it, when they utilize those nutrients, um, they also will uh, respire. So they'll use, uh, so photosynthesis and respiration will lead to that oxygen drawdown in the water column, eventually leading to death and decomposition. So as we saw on that first slide, um, that uh, black shale is anoxic. So essentially it's a um, uh, ge geological analog of what's happening uh, with eutrophication. And eventually we, we um, lose dissolved oxygen in the water column, uh, which leads to death. So this is a zoomed in view of um, by far the largest anoxic zone in the world, not necessarily just the United States. So um, in 2011, um, this is about the size of New Jersey. So this anoxic zone is humongous. This is a huge problem. And uh, the number one uh, source of phosphate to continental margins, to the ocean, is through rivering processes. So as you see here, the Mississippi River Basin is humongous. You have all this agricultural land leading straight to this dead zone here. Um, this is about $82 million per year of lost income from uh, fisheries and from tourism. So this is a huge issue, huge economic issue. And um, to add more fuel to the fire, uh, with global warming, we're seeing more extreme um, hydrological events. So dry areas getting drier, wet areas getting wetter. And in particular, if you think of the Mississippi River, River Basin, which is the center part of the United States here, um, it has definitely seen uh, more precipitation, which is leading to more agricultural runoff to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, over here, just see the same thing. You're seeing uh, an increased stream flow, which makes sense when you have increased precipitation in that region. Uh, and of course, we're seeing more flooding events, uh, particularly in the Mississippi River. So because I work on phosphorus, uh, we have to understand the tools that are used to better understand its cycling. So with phosphorus, um, because it is an anion, it readily absorbs to cation, um, cations. So for example, um, it absorbs to iron and aluminum, um, and then also to calcium. So calcium phosphate, for example, uh, example uh, is uh, apatite, that's a good tooth enamel. Um, iron and aluminum phosphates uh, would be, say, vivinite is reduced iron phosphate. So at the end of the day, because I am interested in how changes in oxygen availability affect phosphorus cycling. I really want to look at these iron pools. I want to look at specifically reduced iron, that's iron two, and oxidized iron, which is iron three, and how it is sorbed to phosphates. So to do that, I use phosphate oxygen isotopes. So unfortunately, phosphorus only has one stable isotope. Because of that, we have to look at the oxygen that's bound to that phosphate. Uh, so we can either grab uh, inorganic phosphate in a suited pool, um, dissolved phosphate in water, or as I said before, an appetite. Uh, we'll convert it to silver phosphate, and then we'll run it on, the, uh, on a uh, mass spec. So just you know, to go home about how, how hard it is to break this phosphorus oxygen bond, we have to essentially um, combust it at more than 400 degrees Celsius. It's a very robust bond, which is very important when it comes to looking in the geologic past. We do not want that bond to be altered. We want that bonds to be uh, essentially set in stone. So when we measure it today, we know we're getting a true isotopic signal. So um, when it comes to phosphorus, going back to that bond, essentially it has to be broken via enzyme reactions. So um, if you look here, this is the abiotic reaction of phosphate with water. Uh, essentially, when it does occur, it occurs over one million year spans of time. 
Uh, so it essentially does not occur. What does occur very rapidly is enzymatic exchange using either inorganic pyrophosphatase, which is this exchange of water here, or alkaline phosphatase. So essentially, when you think back to organic phosphorus, if a microbe is phosphate limited, it will use this enzyme to convert uh, organic phosphorus compounds to the inorganic forms because this phosphate form here is readily available. It is um, readily used by microorganisms. So how does climate change affect nutrient cycling in the present? So I'm gonna segue a bit into nitrogen cycles uh, because going back to red fill ratio, for every 16 atoms of nitrogen, there's one of phosphate, they are linked. So we have nitrogen fixation, we have nitrification. Uh, I want you to note here, this does involve oxygen. So going back to how does redox state affect nutrient cycling, we really need to also understand if nitrification is occurring or if denitrification is occurring. Denitrification, in contrast, does not have oxygen uh, involved in that process. Something else to note is that there are these abiotic processes as well. That would be nitrogen fixation via lightning. Um, and then also, as we'll see, we can also have essentially green rust, um, which will help convert nitrate to ammonium. This is an abiotic process. So what's really important when it comes to understanding biogeochemical cycles is there's both abiotic, so not involving light, and biotic factors that affect those nutrient cycles. So what I did is I collected soil, a soil sample from a salt marsh in Southern Delaware, because I was interested in how can we determine what salinity is happening, or how salinity is affecting these nutrient cycles? But more importantly, what about oxygen availability? So what's cool about salt marshes is that they have a relatively high percentage of reduced iron, that's iron two, that's not oxidized. Um, and so with this specific sediment is it has green rust. So green rusts are a layered iron two, iron three hydroxide that precipitates in these environments. Uh, and so, what I did is uh, I essentially was looking at how green rust is affecting this conversion um, in a microcosm experiment. If you look here, the reduction or the um, decrease in concentration of iron 2 leads to ammonium precipitation. So um, I took that soil, I put it in um, these microcosm bottles, and I expect, uh, exposed it to different degrees of salinity. Um, to one, determine how salinity affects nutrient cycling, which is really important when it comes to sea level, level, sea level rise when you have uh, saltwater intrusion. But also, as you see here, some of these, they're, they're pretty much anoxic because I didn't really expose them to air. So it was twofold. Um, I did uh, remove the, me the mesosaline from these graphs to make it easier for, for you guys to see. So. Uh, Thinking back to um, the nitrogen cycle, we have nitrification, which is a conversion of um, ammonia um, to nitrite to nitrate. It happens in anyone's fish tank, you guys have a fish tank. Uh, and I specifically was interested in this ammonia monooxygenase. Uh, it is an enzyme that is the first in the rate limiting step in nitrification. So this is gene expression data that I got from collaborators in, uh, in Chile. So as we see here, we see that increase in nitrate concentration over the first few days of the experiment, um, which matches up quite well with uh, ammonia monooxygenase um, being expressed uh, in this freshwater sample. Um, as we see here, next we have a different process, so it's denitrification. Uh, and to determine if denitrification is occurring, uh, we can look at gene expression data of nitrous oxide uh, reductase, which is actually under anaerobic conditions in the presence of nitrate or nitrous oxide. So as expected, we're seeing this nitrous oxide reductase being expressed in both these samples. Uh, so we're seeing a decrease in these nitrate concentrations over time um, leading to uh, ammonia. So uh, what about that abiotic control group? So that control group was autoclave. There should be no microbes present. Um, but we have to remember there was green rust. There's green rust in these salt marshes. So how does green rust affect nitrogen cycling? Uh, and so uh, essentially, we see that it's reducing nitrate. It's an abiotic reduction of nitrates, which is only possible because there's a, there's a small amount of phosphate present in the sample, 
And two, the pH is relatively uh, neutral slash acidic. So because of both of those two factors, we're able to see this in the field, which otherwise has only been replicated in experiments. So it's really cool seeing this actually happen with soil sediments as opposed to in a chemistry lab. So what about nitrogen isotopes? So nitrogen isotopes are quite messy in that um, the magnitude of their fractionation is variable depending on the rate of the reaction and then also um, the amount of starting material. So as you see here, it's a little messy in the sediment, but the supernatant, which is the top part of this bottle here, we see a very clear trend in terms of um, actual denitrification um, occurring at day 14 in that seawater sample. So essentially, um, we see isotopic fractionation in the first few days due to both those nitrification and denitrification processes that we saw with our um, nitrate and ammonium concentration data. Uh, and then at the end of the experiment, um, we see primarily denitrification and that seawater sample. Um, so how is this linked to phosphorus? What's phosphorus um, also doing in these bottles? So uh, remember, we have two different forms of phosphorus. We have organic phosphorus compounds and inorganic phosphorus compounds. So I'm looking at the inorganic form, that's PO4, 3 minus. So you can add up all of these different pools to get our total dissolved inorganic phosphorus concentrations over time. So the one take home message I want you to get from this, this uh, study is that with increasing salinity, we see an increase in inorganic P being released, which is really bad when it comes to, again, saltwater intrusion and that when coastal, coastal regions get saltier, more phosphate is released, which further um, adds uh, more phosphate to coastal regions, which we do not want at least in trophication. So uh, then after about day three, um, we essentially see no conversion um, of, again, that dissolved organic phosphorus. So we, we use um, alkaline phosphatase to convert organic phosphorus to inorganic phosphorus. And so we don't see that occurring um, in the control groups because there's no microbes to do that. Uh, however, in the, the sample groups, we do see that occurring um, because they are becoming phosphate limited. So since they're becoming phosphate limited, they have to utilize the alkaline phosphatase to grab more of that organic phosphorus and convert it to inorganic phosphorus. So we think back to these pools here. Um, we're now going to focus on this sodium bicarbonate pool, uh, which is essentially just more bioavailable. So uh, organisms have a harder time accessing the phosphate in these pools because they are sorbed to cations. Phosphate that's found in this pool, um, or this Olson key pool, is much more uh, available because um, it's not sorbed to anything, it's just free phosphate. So uh, essentially what we can see with this uh, alkaline phosphatase activity Remember again, whenever organisms are phosphate limited, they will split organic phosphorus with water using this enzyme to create free phosphate. And we see a lot of that occurring in the freshwater sample in the first few days. So essentially it was, um, which makes sense, right? Because if a sample is saline, it's gonna have more phosphate release. So remember with increased salinity, we see increased cations release and with that increased phosphate release. So if it's freshwater, we're not gonna see that phosphate being released. So in other words, the freshwater sample was phosphate limited initially. And because of that, we see that higher alkaline phosphate activity in the first few days. All right. So again, what about iron and aluminum? When it comes down to it, when it comes to looking at redox, we're really interested in what's happening with iron, specifically if it's iron two or iron three. So same thing. With the first two days, um, we see increased phosphate mobilization with increased salinity over time, and then it stabilizes. Uh, so something else to note is that the iron concentration in the sediment seems artificially high. Um, that's because it was essentially suspended um, in the, the samples, but it stayed in the sediment um, for the control groups. So essentially in these, in these sample groups, the iron was still there, but it was in these sediments. Um, so when it comes to thinking about euxinia uh, and hypoxia, so essentially lack of oxygen, whenever you have the reduction of iron 3 to iron 2, so going from oxygen conditions to anoxin conditions, 
um, you have phosphate release, which can be really bad because it acts as a positive feedback loop, adding more phosphorus to the water column, further leading to um, eutrophication, which we do not want. So um, another project I'm working on is essentially determining um, the role of uh, seasonal anoxia in Chesapeake Bay, uh, but using it, uh, using stable isotopes of phosphate to better determine what, what's happening. So essentially you can see whether or not, again, this, this ferric iron bound people, so whether it's Fe3 um, or Fe2, um, look at its oxygen isotopic composition of the phosphate to see whether it's in or out of equilibrium. So some preliminary data showed that um, in this specific site um, over time, so this is over about 10 years, um, we do see that it's out of equilibrium. What we do not know is the seasonal influence of um, when there's oxygen in the steel site versus no oxygen. So to that extent, I collected some samples uh, via scuba diving because of COVID restrictions, um, so I had to get creative. Um, so I'm actually working on that project. I am a geologist, so I am also interested in how uh, nutrient cycling in the past has changed and how climate affects that. So just a quick overview about um, delta zone of water. So when it comes to looking at um, nutrient cycling in the past, it's extremely important to constrain what's happening with precipitation. Because remember, it's that, infla it's that increased precipitation that leads to continental weathering, which then leads to nutrients being transported to coastal regions. So essentially, at the end of the day, your delta zone becomes heavier with increasing temperature. But more importantly, this delta zone of water is a proxy for precipitation, temperature, ice volume, and elevation. I'm ultimately interested in how uh, precipitation is changing over time and how it affects nutrient cycles. So to better constrain what's happening with uh, past climate, we can use plumps isotopes. So uh, essentially, um, we measure um, car our carbon dioxide. So we convert uh, carbonate to carbon dioxide. And the higher abundance of um, or the, the more heavier uh, atoms that are bonded to, to each other tend to occur at lower temperatures. So they clump. So at lower temperatures, these um, elements tend to clump more often. So at the end of the day, this delta 47 is directly related to temperature, uh, which is, again, really important for constraining how those changes in temperature affect um, weathering and uh, nutrient runoff. But what about delta of water? What do we do with delta of water? Um, so over the last 56 years, the problem has always been this three variable problem. So delta you know, phosphate, it depends on both temperature and the isotopic composition of the water in which it is precipitated. So what's great about pumped isotopes is that it does not depend on the bulk composition of the material that you're measuring. It only depends on temperature. So we can combine it with delta you know, phosphate. And if we remember that PO bond is extremely robust, and it's very rarely diagenically altered, whereas carbonate is much more likely to be altered. So by pairing these two together, we can constrain this delta in of water um, over time, which is really important. So specifically, um, because I'm looking at phosphates, I look at um, hydroxyapatite, which is uh, a calcium phosphate. Um, but with clumped isotopes, I'm looking specifically at the small weight percent of carbonate that's substituted for the phosphate in the mineral lattice. So essentially, I measure the phosphate option, I saw the composition of this phosphate here. Um, I get uh, delta 47, our temperature value from the small percent of carbonate to back calculate delta of water. So um, another issue that has played paleoclimate is just like a lack of a terrestrial paleothermometer. So there's a wealth of data in terms of foreign data from the world's oceans. Uh, but again, these are oceans. What about on land? So on land, uh, we can get the sense of what's happening from plants, sediments, and fossil assemblages, but they're all indirect. What's great about um, isotopic, uh, isotopic geochemistry is that it's essentially a direct measurement of when that uh, mineral was mineralized. And so I specifically looked at uh, freshwater fish fossils um, and used them as a uh, terrestrial uh, paleoclimate proxy. So I specifically looked at the scales of garfish. Um, gars are alive today. You find them uh, east of the Mississippi River. So here, shaded uh, in this gray here, but 
in the past in the Cretaceous, they were much more widespread. And so what's great is that not only do they have um, a very long uh, temporal history going back 100 million years, but they also are, again, geographically widespread. And more important is that because they're exotherms, whenever the, when they mineralize their scales, their scales take on the climate parameters, the climate conditions of the water in which they're swimming. And what's great is that that water um, is directly related to atmospheric temperature. So essentially, you can measure the isotopic composition of their ganoin scales, which is just appetite. It's highly mineralized. Um, and use them as a uh, terrestrial climate proxy. So uh, this is all clumped isotopic data from the last 20 years. Uh, clumped isotopes primarily, uh, well, it started using uh, carbonate. So that's foraminifera, uh, that's essentially shells, uh, corals. And so you see this giant cloud of data. And what we do see is we, we do see there's a definite trend, a different relationship between temperature on the x-axis and our delta 47 value. What I added to the story is specifically bioappetite. Um, and so I'll, again, there's that clear relationship. But what's different with, uh, with just looking at bioappetite is that it's a steeper slope than looking at pure carbonate. So remember, I'm still looking at carbonate, but it's in bioappetite. Um, and because these are, these are fish, there are specific enzymes that, are, that might change this slope compared to the slope, say, pure calcites. All right, so that's one part of the question. What about the other part? What about delta of phosphate? Remember, we have delta of water, delta of phosphate, and clump isotopes. So I also calibrated a, a relationship looking at delta of phosphate in these gar fish. So uh, this was first done with Claudine and Luz in the 70s. Um, it was recently recalibrated um, using uh, silver phosphate, which is what I showed you before. Uh, have really a real clear relationship. But the question is, would this hold true for a freshwater fish that has uh, proteins that essentially make enamel like mammals do? Um, so other fish, like other teleos, like a goldfish, they don't have that enamel protein that um, garfish do. So the question is, would that be distinct? And the answer is yes. So this uh, was a unique curve um, compared to that of um, other phosphate materials. So what about putting two and two together? Will this work? And the answer is yes. Um, so this is a one-to-one -one line. Um, so essentially, um, whenever you have, uh, whenever you use these two equations together, you can back calculate that delta of water, which is really important when it comes to looking at hydrological cycles in the past. And again, how that freshwater runoff leads to uh, nutrient uh, eutrophication. So I, add, I uh, applied this to a section across the KBG in North Dakota. Uh, so something to note, if you think back a few slides, the previous terrestrial climate proxies were either leaf margin analysis, which you see here, or with paleosols. The issue with leaf margin analysis is it tends to underestimate temperature. Paleosols tends to overestimate temperature by about four degrees C. So what is actually happening with temperature over this time span? So um, I looked at the clumps, I saw the composition of gar scales across the KPG. Um, and what was really neat with my data is that you actually see this ink, this warming pulse here, which is coincident with um, the second phase of Deccan trout volcanism. And of course, as expected, we also see that, that, ink, that warming right across the KPG boundary. Uh, so what was also neat is that uh, Tom Tobin, um, he's now at uh, Alabama, but he, has a, had a few bivalve data um, across this boundary. But when it comes to looking at carbonates, you have to be very careful that they are exceptionally well preserved. If they're not, that isotopic composition might be reset. So he actually had to throw out a lot of his data um, because they were not well preserved. Um, what's great about these bar scales is that they're almost always well preserved. Um, so they are a reliable terrestrial climate proxy. And as you see here, my data lines up quite well with his data. Uh, same thing is that you see that, that um, warming right before the KPG boundary. But at the end of the day, I am ultimately interested in what's happening with Delta HNO water over time. So um, this is a paper put out by Henry Fricke. And so essentially what he found is evidence of a, of a seasonal monsoon um, in this region um, as, it, as evidenced by, again, um, carbonate uh, fossils. 
So um, he saw essentially a uh, depletion and delting of water um, as you go further from the Western Interior Seaway. Uh, and as expected, um, my delting of water values, um, they do follow temperature because again, delting of water is related to temperature, but also to precipitation. So again, proof of concept, yes, this proxy does work. Yes, it does agree with what we have, but more importantly, it is much more robust than, um, again, leaf margin analysis or uh, paleosols. So what about these ocean anoxic events and other climatic events with increased temperatures? So essentially these OAEs are disturbances in the carbon cycle, which are exemplified by Delta 13C excursions, both positive and negative and widespread organic carbon burial. So essentially what's thought to occur is that you have an influx of CO2, um, such as from volcanism. Um, so as I said before, it's a Deccan trap volcanism or um, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. There's many large ign igneous provinces that could be sources of CO2 into the atmosphere, or you can have a removal of heavy carbon through enhanced burial. So at the end of the day, this um, CO2 influx uh, it causes a uh, causes a uh, temperature rise, which leads to increased continental weathering. So an increased hydrological cycle. Again, same thing that's happening today, uh, which promotes a nutrient influx to the ocean, resulting in eutrophic conditions. So this is a this photo here is from um, southern uh, UK, and what's really cool is that you see these really nice laminated black shales, which say the same thing: is that you have these these periods of anoxia which is leading again to um, high organic carbon burial. So same thing, you see that increase in CO2 into the atmosphere, an increase in temperature leads to an increased hydrological cycle, increased weathering, um, which then eventually leads to more nutrients to coastal regions, increased organic productivity, water column or oxygen water demand increases. And at the end of the day, you move from poorly oxygenated to anoxic and ultimately eucinic. So, um, this is a, a graph of uh, what's thought to have occurred during ocean oxygen event two. And they looked at specific phosphorus pools and their concentration and how they changed uh, over the course of the OAE. But at the end of the day, what is uncertain is how do we return to pre. OAE conditions. So these authors argue that there was uh, essentially drought conditions, which led to this, this pre anoxic conditions. But those drought conditions were not seeing as much water runoff, as much runoff to coastal regions, et cetera, accelerating that nutrient influx. But at the end of the day, they don't have delta no water values to back that up. Uh, more importantly, they also don't have phosphate oxygen isotopic values to better ascertain what is happening um, across these events. So thinking back a few slides, um, depending on whether or not those phosphate oxygen isotopic values are in or out of the equilibrium, we can better determine what's happening microbially uh, during these events. So um, what's great about Texas is that we have the Eagle Ford Shale. And the Eagle Ford Shale goes all the way from, here's Dallas right here, it goes all the way to West Texas. Um, and it's right across the cinnamonian Turonian boundary 94 million years ago. So uh, if you remember OAEs, um, they've happened multiple times in the past. The question is whether or not they are uh, global in extent or more localized. So essentially by looking at the Eagle Ford Shale um, in Texas and looking specifically at um, how those, phosph those phosphate pools are changing, specifically reduced iron phosphate and oxidized iron phosphate and maybe um, pairing it with a redox proxy such as molybdenum, um, we can get a better understanding of what's happening with OAE2 in the past. Uh, when it comes to the present, again, the past is sort of a sandbox for the present because at the end of the day, we don't know, we don't know how we go to pre-OAE conditions. Like once, clearly we have major eutrophication in the modern, but how do we remove that phosphate from the system? How is it naturally removed from the system? Um, and then are there ways to, are, to essentially do engineer that phosphate removal? So here, uh, this is work on Eagle Ford Shale. Um, it's really nice that you see OAE2 right here. Here you have that, that nice um, carbon isotope excursion. And these sections are, are quite large. And so you can get a really good resolution of what's happening 
um, across this boundary uh, in the Western Interior Seaway. And you could do it not just one point, but throughout the whole Eagle Forge Shell to get a better understanding to, uh, ge um, geographically what's happening in the Western Interior Seaway across this ocean and ox event. Um, some other um, thoughts I've had are essentially doing the same thing with the end Triassic extinction. So same thing, uh, it was not specifically an ocean oxic event, but we do see evidence for uh, increased CO2 production from volcanism. So this is specifically from the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. Um, and as you see here, all the outcrops are right along the modern East Coast. Um, and uh, during this time period, um, we see evidence of, uh, again, laminated black shales, Thinking back to his previous slides in the southern part of the UK, um, those are deposited also during the uh, in Triassic uh, extinction. So um, what's really neat is that uh, in Connecticut, you see really well-preserved fish fossils. Um, and so what's really cool about these fish fossils, um, so they're not garfish, but they're close related species, calcium phosphate. So you can actually use them uh, as a proxy to determine what's happening with, um, with uh, phosphorus and nutrient cycling over this time period. And that's important because this is just published, um, I think just in January, um, they found that there was a two-pronged uh, mechanism for the in Triassic extinction. So essentially you have euxenic events, or um, euxenia, which is essentially means um, lack of oxygen, but with sulfur involved, which goes back to some of these scales are pyrotized, right? And so we'll, we'll see that whenever it's deposited in a euxenic environment. Uh, but, but next, we have um, decalcification from ocean acidification. Since, so essentially, they argue that there's a two-pronged extinction event that led to the in triassic extinction. Unfortunately, with decalcification, with acidification, you have no form of nifer preserved. And thinking back um, to traditional paleoclimate proxies, those are forms, right? You can measure the stable isotope composition of forms to determine what's happening uh, in terms of climate. But if we don't have forums, how do we determine what's happening? So thinking back to those fish scales, we can measure both their clumped isotopes and also their phosphate oxygen isotopes to get a better sense of what's happening, not only with hydrological cycles, but also with phosphorus cycling across this really important boundary. And again, how specifically is this delta no P changing that of iron bound P? Remember, whenever we have reduction of uh, iron three, to iron two, we have release of phosphate, which can lead to a positive feedback loop, which is what we do not want in the present. It further, uh, um, further exasperates the uh, eutrophication problem. All right, lastly, how do we use phosphorus sustainably in the future? So as I'm sure you guys know, uh, we have a uh, peak oil. So that was a uh, King Hubert. So essentially, what time do we have, at what point in time do we reach the rate at which um, mining of phosphate rock and utilization uh, reaches its peak. And so it's argued that peak phosphorus is uh, closely approaching. So uh, most phosphate rock is mined in Morocco, um, which is not the best idea when you have 70% of the world's reserves in one region, as opposed to, I think the remaining uh, concentrations are in uh, the US and in China. Um, so, so what do we do once we reach peak phosphorus? Um, so at the end of the day, we can be more efficient in terms of our food chain, changing diets and agriculture, or what I'm specifically interested in is how can we reuse phosphorus? So essentially once phosphorus reaches an estuary, it's extremely difficult, not impossible to remove it. Um, it's just economically not feasible. So we essentially have to pre prevent phosphorus from reaching those estuaries. Uh, and that's again, trying to look at that point source pollution. Um, so this specifically can be say wastewater treatment plants. So I'm not gonna go into the details, but um, already most wastewater treatment plants have biological nutrient removal in place. Uh, so essentially they have ways to remove phosphate and ammonia from the system, uh, preventing it from reaching say, you know, a reservoir down the street or eventually a estuary. And what's really neat is that there's uh, promising research in terms of removing this phosphate either through struvite production. So that's essentially like a, a kidney stone or through vivianite. Vivianite uh, is a iron two phosphate, 
So we can remove this phosphorus from the system, but more importantly, we can conserve it as a mineral, which then can be reapplied to agricultural land. Because at the end of the day, we have to conserve phosphorus um, because we do have a finite resource in terms of phosphate rock. So in conclusion, increased rivering runoff from global warming is increasing peat transport to coastal water waterways, exasperating uh, eutrophication. Uh, oxygen availability affects pea cycling, and our delta no pea can be used as a tracer to determine the role redox plays in pea burial or release. And most importantly, a past is key to the present. Remember those ocean oxic events, they're essentially a sandbox of eutrophication in the past that we can use as a tool to better determine how to deal with eutrophication in the present. So we can use these tools to do it. So clumps isotopes to figure temperature, um, delta no P to determine P's role in nutrient cycling, and of course, our delta no water to determine what's happening with precipitation patterns over time. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, our peak phosphorus is approaching if it has not already come, um, and we do need to reduce our recycled phosphorus. And I just want to thank my, my funding sources, um, and gold we'll tags over here, but the USDA has funded my postdoc, um, and specifically is looking at eutrophication in Delaware Bay and Chesapeake Bay, um, uh, also uh, EPSCOR, the Project Wicked, Wicked, and then in graduate school, uh, the Peabody Museum helps me with uh, fossil, fossil material, uh, and then also the Pioneer Trails Regional Museum in North Dakota. Um, so with that, I will open up to questions. You know, I talk fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, open for questions. Maybe while people are thinking of things. Digesting. What's, uh, what's the biggest surprise to you in, in your research, the thing that's kind of been mind-blowing or something? It's, it's really the fact that, like, paleontologists have seen these OAEs in the past, but um, there really hasn't been a, a geochemical interpretation of what's happening. Um, and half of that is because nitrogen isotopes, they're just not preserved in the rock record. So one of these slides actually looks at, uh oh, here we go. Actually looks at nitrogen isotopes, but this is not, it's not a robust indicator of what's happening with productivity. Um, so at the end of the day, we have to also determine what's happening with primary productivity, which you can kind of do a barium, but that's a whole nother, whole nother can of worms in that um, you could potentially do it with um, uh, triple option isotopes of solar phosphate, um, and it hasn't been done yet, but that's like methods development. So I guess at the end of the day, it really comes down to, we just don't understand what's happening with primary, primary productivity in the past and how that's affecting nutrient cycling. Um, and it goes back to just, it's, there's so many variables at play. You have to kind of just like sit down, print out all your sheets and like determine how variable A is really the variable B. Um, and it just, it takes a lot of, not necessarily data collection, but just data interpretation. And like, just like thinking about what is happening with these processes. Yeah, so I'm not Greta Keller at Princeton, but um, from my understanding, I think there was already a disturbance before the KBG. Uh, I mean, I don't think it was the primary driver, but you have to remember that this is one data point across the KBG, um, and you really would just need a, a better understanding of what's happening globally um, in the terrestrial realm. So obviously we have lots of ocean, um, oceanographic data, which is what's happening with you know forum diversity before and after the event. But when it comes down to it, that increase in CO2 is causing global warming. So the oceans can absorb some of that CO2 um, and you know become acidified and whatnot, but you can't really get an idea of what's happening in the terrestrial realm again unless you have more data points. But um, I would I would argue that it has to play some sort of a role, but it goes back to we don't know the extent of that warming. And we don't know if this was, again, a localized event, as this just happened to be because that place in North Dakota was, I think it was maybe 10 degrees in latitude more further south. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Uh, um, 
Are they mostly from fossils or? It's everything. <laughs> so, um, so my paleoclimate work has been primarily uh, in fossil material, uh, but in the modern, um, it can be soil samples, um, water samples, um, sediment samples, if it's like say in the past. Uh, and so just you have to use different methods to, to turn to solar phosphate, but there's a wide variety of materials that you can um, convert to solar phosphate. What you're ultimately limited by is its initial phosphate concentration. Um, so we've gotten much better resolution just over the past 10 years with changes in methodology to make solar phosphate and run it on the mass spec. Um, but we're always wondering like, how can we decrease that concentration even more? So uh, my grad students in our lab, um, they're, they're looking at very low concentrations of phosphate, but sometimes they just don't get data because they don't have enough phosphate. Um, and so one way that it, we could potentially fix that is um, we can use an orbit track, um, which is a just different kind of mass spec. So it's nice that you can potentially use lower concentrations of phosphate to get its isotopic composition. Um, but that method is still very, very much in its infancy. Um, there's a, a guy who's at Caltech now, he's uh, in Colorado, Nordar, but he's going to look to see how, how can we use an, an orbit trap and then how can we use that to, again, measure phosphate, that phosphate oxygen isotope? Because yeah, at the end of the day, we're limited by just like how the concentration is being put. So your chart there mentions conodonts. Have you looked at conodonts? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, are they useful in the deep Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there is a paper by Joe Kims, Joe Kimsey, um, that was maybe 2010, 2011. So he specifically looked at phosphate oxygen isotopes and conodonts over time, but it goes back to you still don't know the delta no water concentrate or composition. So you assume it's zero, but it could be changed over time. We don't know. So yes, condoms are useful, but one, you have to combine a bunch of them to get enough, again, concentration, phosphate concentration to measure isotopic composition, but also again, three variable problems. So yes. Um, so in like 93, 95, and then another big one in 2005 to 2007, we had these die-offs in the Texas waterways, mm. specifically the Trinity River. Yeah. And uh, so in 93, it was thought to have been, I mean, it was definitely uh, uh, phosphorus, but the rates were like triple what EPA allows. And so the idea was that it was development in wetlands upstream mm. um, that released a, a lot of this. Uh, and then in 2004, the, the one that happened in 2005, uh, it was development in the Trinity River bottoms, um, because we don't understand how zoning works in Texas. And so <laughs> they built a bunch of like poor community, like Section 8 housing in yeah. this area and a uh, huge die off downstream. Um, and so uh, I guess you were mentioning that it's like a positive feedback loop of when things become anoxic. Mm -hmm. It releases phosphate. It releases yes. Yes. So all of this development in these wetlands would make these anoxic conditions toxic, right? Uh, that's also argued with how we get out of these conditions, is that if it becomes anoxic enough, enough phosphate is released, and essentially the surface water will become oxygenated, and then that will trickle down to the bottom water. So at the end of the day, it's like it has to go from surface water to bottom water. But at the same time, we still don't know how to get back to oxygen conditions. Like we are hand wavy, we kind of understand but actually, on that note with the Trinity River, um, I know there's I actually looked at a, it was like last week, um, the pollution in it and um, flame retardants, like with a phosphate backbone, they're, they're um, halogenated, are absurdly high also. Um, so that was a whole nother <laughs> sign. No, I went on. Um, but yeah, so at least with phosphate oxygen isotopes, you can actually use them for source tracking because um, that triple superphosphate has a specific isotopic composition. So if you're measuring that in your water sample and it has the same isotopic composition, you're like, I know specifically the source of this, whether it's from fertilizer or from a wastewater treatment plant that isn't abiding by, say, EPA rules. And uh, one more thing. Um, we had a, an alumnus here named Nate Miller who's at uh, UC Austin now, and he, did, he was part of the study where they were using lake regulation to look at autoliths of fish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every year you get a new lamination and it's yeah. important. And so they were uh, looking at other pollution pollutants, but they noticed that if you basically take away the industry or the agriculture signature of phosphorus, mm -hmm. that the annual cyclicity of it actually increases in winter, which mm -hmm. is yeah. in any reason why Yeah, so, um, so one of the projects I have an undergrad working on right now is looking at seasonal changes in uh, phosphorus concentrations 
and uh, I saw the compositions of nitrogen and carbon uh, in this Murdoco River. Uh, and what we actually see is, yeah, the highest concentrations are actually in the fall. And so uh, what I'm assuming is what, ha what happens is that you have an influx, the lowest is in the spring. And so influx is like in the summer months, like late summer, highest in the fall or winter. And that could just be um, after um, crops are harvested, you then have that, that runoff into the water. And it's really localized, like every region is different. Um, and also different, depends on the soil chemistry as well. Some soils are much better about retaining phosphorus um, compared to other soils. And also just like particle size, like smaller particles. So like silt is much better at keeping phosphorus locked in compared to like larger size grains like sand, for example. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's also localized, so. Yeah. Hi, we actually have some Zoom questions, if you wouldn't mind answering. Uh, David, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, I appreciate it. Um, David from the Peanut Gallery. Uh, just a great presentation, clear stuff. Um, I like it a lot. Just real quickly, I was actually wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about what classes would you like to develop to teach students that align with your research interests? And also, how would you like to integrate students, whether it's undergrad researchers or, or grad students, into your research endeavors going forward? Yeah, um, so I think the, the easiest thing is, um, I would love to teach like stable isotope geochemistry, but more importantly, um, and I mentioned this at dinner last night, you can use isotopes as a tracer, as an environmental tracer, um, and that could be, say, for example, environmental forensics. So Americans, we eat a lot of corn, we have a very clear C4 signal in our hair compared to European. So it could be something as easy as um, using isotopes, again, to figure out forensics, like what's happening. Um, I think that would be an easy way to get students involved. And then something as uh, nice as, you know, collecting soil samples or water samples on campus um, and using them for source tracking exercises. And there's a plethora of um, eutrophic dams in the, in the Dallas area and in Texas in general. And it's just like so many opportunities just again for source tracking projects. Um, I think that would really prepare students if they're if they want to go in the environmental consulting route. Um, and then obviously like just collecting samples in the field uh, with either undergrads or graduate students. Um, I said, I was, I'm really interested in Eagle Forge Dale, but also just collaborations with um, other groups um, for other sediments that go across um, different OAE events. Um, but yeah, and then in terms of graduate level courses, um, biogeochemistry, I think is like definitely something I would love to teach and would do really well at. Any more Zoom questions? Nope. Thank you. So you mentioned that there was phosphorus released when seawater came to the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is that? Um, so uh, my understanding is that um, you see this, this cation mobilization. I think it partly has to do with um, changes in pH. So, and just solubility. Um, and so that's actually what um, the, uh, another postdoc in my lab is specifically looking at uh, different forms of phosphorus, specifically hydroxyapatite, and change its solubility by changing its cation species. So, I think at the end of the day, it just depends on um, how solubility is being affected by salinity. Uh, and I just don't know enough about it because I'm not a pure chemist. Um, but I, that's my inclination that is that's what's happening is that you're changing that KSP value um, of like one specific mineral. Um, which is causing it to be um, dissolved. I've got another question. It's a data analysis question. Okay. So a lot of your, particularly in the early slides, um, plotting concentrations over time, like the 80s, also in the, in the field samples, in yours and other people's mm -hmm. plots you showed, a lot of those plots have a high degree of Jaggedness, you know, variability. Yep. Yep. And whenever I see that, I wonder is this an aliasing issue that we're not, there's, there's something we're not sampling fine enough because everybody is always tempted to connect the dots, yeah, right? Yeah. Lines. Is it an aliasing issue or is it a lab control? Like it, maybe if you could control your, mm -hmm. your lab experiments mm -hmm. better somehow, you could. You know, yeah. or you see more of a coherent pattern. What would you? What's your thoughts on? So that? the joke in geochemistry is that it's wiggle matching, um, and so the data is almost always messy, um, and so there does come to be a point that 
potentially with having a finer resolution, you might get a better sense of what's happening with long-term trends. Like even looking at, you know, like the Zappos curve, which is how um, auction isotopes are changing over time. There's a huge error bar across all of those measurements. Um, and so I think it's just a geochemistry issue in general, but it comes down to like how, how can we better um, constrain, you know, those error bars? How do we minimize those error bars? And at least for my, uh, my microcosm experiments or just experimentation, it's largely just like removing more variables and just looking at one or two variables at a time, and especially with biogeochemistry is that it's, it's almost hard to remove too many variables because it's so, it, there's so many things at play. Um, but I would say that that's the, the first starting point is try to minimize the amount of variables you have, um, and that might help minimize the uncertainty, because it's not the instrumentation. The instrumentation degree of uncertainty is, is pretty small, especially with the new mass specs. Um, so um, it could just be, you know, like heterogeneity in the soil, for example, or in your, your water column. Um, and so, yeah, it goes back to geochemistry is wiggle matching. <laughs> so. so sometimes, so I'm a time lapse analysis. And sometimes we get surprised that the finer we sample in time, we see surprising things all the mm, time. Yeah. Have, have you ever, or maybe others in your field, run experiments where you try to uh, over, greatly oversample in time yeah. so you could see, I mean, just ridiculous. Like mm -hmm. Let's take samples every minute mm -hmm. or every hour yeah. or whatever and see if there's anything so on that note, um, so uh, my ultimate advisor at Yale, um, she was looking at the fractionation of microbes and, D and essentially the phosphate oxygen isotope fractionation DNA. And she took it at very, very minute time scales. And her error bars are almost non-existent. Like there, it's a very robust estimate. Um, so yeah, there is a, a sense of when you're sampling over longer time periods that you're gonna see more of this variation as opposed to a smaller scale. Um, but uh, at the same time, she only had a few data points because it's just so hard to sample when you're on like that quick of a, a time span, especially with microbial experiments is that um, sometimes you have to, you know, like dip it in liquid nitrogen to essentially freeze those enzymatic processes um, because any, any extra time you add on is going to change your data and your interpretation. Yeah. Other questions? No, people will be meeting. Uh, Occasionally, one on ones and in groups and things like that. So, maybe with that, we'll wrap it up right on schedule, actually. But thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'll just exit out of the Zoom. Yep, you're all good. Thank you. Thank you. Record.